Love begins by taking care of the closest ones, the ones at home, Mother Teresa. An, an estimated 65.7 million Americans provide unpaid care for an adult or child with functional or cognitive limitations. In concept 52, we are going to discuss caregiving. The objectives of this lesson will define and describe the concept of caregiving, recognize stressors related to caregiving, and implement appropriate interventions to support caregivers for positive outcomes. What is a caregiver? Who can be a caregiver? These are the questions that we'll discuss today. According to the National Alliance for Caregiving, Caregivers are defined as those who provide unpaid care to an adult or a child with special needs. Dentera describes caregiving as providing unpaid support and assistance to family members or acquaintances who have physical or psychological or developmental needs. But caregiving is made up of actions one does on behalf of another individual with or without health related conditions. The scope of the caregiver ranges from being in a temporary caregiving role or um, being in a more permanent caregiver role. This can be if the illness is a temporary illness or if the illness ends up being more of a long-term illness. Um, these acute limiting conditions can range from um, conditions like myocardial infarction, burns, um, asthma, pneumonia, or traumatic injuries. Um, chronic conditions or illnesses can be conditions like dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cancer, diabetes, um, and stroke. Family care giving is central to long-term care in the United States and is the main source of assistance for the elderly and the disabled. There's been an increased need for family caregivers over the last couple years. This is because the population continues to age. Um, with the baby boomer population. Also with the chronic diseases, people are living longer and having more increased complex healthcare needs. Also the formal healthcare system, healthcare system is overwhelmed. So therefore um, they're not able to stay in the hospital as long and they still need care, but they need to go home and receive that care. So they rely on their family, family to provide this care. Um, some families choose not to put their family member into long-term care facilities. So they choose to provide this care at home. And this, um, pop, this population becomes known, what we consider as you may hear them called like the sandwich generation. And this is where they are caring for their um, mother and father. And they're also then caring for um, their children as well. Um, it is estimated that there's 14% of family caregivers provide for their children with special needs, and um, whereas 50% provide care for one's parents. So as you can see, um, there's a significant amount of people providing care for a family member. So let's talk about the type of caregivers. The first one we'll talk about is the spousal caregiver. And this one is, they are commonly caring for their spouse with significant physical or cognitive disorders. Um, and oftentimes the spousal caregiver often have to face the reality that they have lost the husband or wife that they once knew. And so they go through this period of time where they have this adjustment time and they have to face this new reality. The second um, caregiver that we will talk about is the adult children caregiver. And like I said in the earlier slides, this is what becomes known as like the sandwich generation. And this is where the adult children caregiver are often caregivers for their elderly parents. And this is an increase in this phenomenon due to the part that medical and technolo techno technological advances um, have extended the life expectancy. And so the impact of this caregiver can be overwhelming for the adult children caregiver who have um, assumed multiple roles now, right? Because they're also caring for their parents and they're also caring for their own children. Uh, the third one we'll talk about now is the grandparent caregiver here. And, to, and this is um, where the grandparents are now raising their grandchildren and providing care in, in a variety of ways. And according to study, um, about 5.8 million grandparents live with a grandchild. And about 6.5 million 
children throughout the United States live in households maintained by grandparents. And this is for a multitude of reasons. And the most common reasons why grandparents become the primary caregivers are that their own children may have passed away or have abandoned their grandchildren, have a mental illness or substance abuse problem, or are in prison. And other factors leading to grandparent-led households include child abuse and neglect. So oftentimes the grandparents have to step in due to the primary parent um, being unable to provide care for these children. So now the grandparents who are usually more elderly in life have to step in. So it can be very stressful for these grandparents to provide this care for their um, um, grandchildren. And then finally, the, the last group of caregivers is this parental caregiver. And so, you know, parents have always been, been on average, have been caregivers longer than those who have other kind of relationships. But as, you know, the primary role of parents is the provision of their children. But when parents become the caregivers of their children is when the children are at an age at which they would normally be expected to care for themselves, right? So you're expected as parents, we're expected to care for our children at least to the age of 18, right? Um, but this, you know, this can be due to a disability such as a severe physical or cognitive limitations. So this can happen later in life from an accident, you know, like a spinal cord injury or another debilitating illness or a severe or physical, um, severe, severe physical or emotional trauma experience like military combat. Um, and these can lead to significant stressors for a parent um, where now these children are now dependent on them for their care throughout the rest of their life. Um, so you can see that these are, you know, um, where these, where then these parents, you know, need to decide that these children are not gonna be able to actually launch into their depend, you know, their independence. So what kind of qualities does a caregiver need? Well, the need for love, affection, empathy, compassion, and holistic care have been identified as requisite emotion or antecedents to the concept of caregiver. So the caregiver needs to have the ability to provide care, right? So even when we think of us being a nurse, um, whether you're caring for another patient or providing for a family member, these caregivers need to be able to care for someone else. Not everybody is made out to be a caregiver or to even their own family member, if you really think about it. Um, the, the, ever, to be a good caregiver, you need to be able to adapt to a situation. And, and as you look over this list, this is the same thing for being, a, you know, to be a good nurse. Um, because situations change, even, even when you're taking care of your children, you need to be able to, to, be able to adapt to these situations being a good listener, um, showing affection. Um, when you're providing good quality care, you are showing love and affection. Nobody wants anybody who's just kind of meanly turning them in bed or cleaning them up. We do it with a, you know, a smile and with warmth in our hearts because it, it does show. Um, being responsible for someone else. Um, just as you take care of yourself and you take care of your children, this also reflects in taking care of your patients. Um, and even for these folks that are caring for their family members, um, if you can't take care of yourself, you really can't take care of somebody else. Um, another attribute is being strong, protective, organized, patient, and understanding. Again, situations, being able to adapt to these situations, um, you need to be strong. You need to really wanna protect them protect them from any harm and be organized. If it's chaotic in the home, you're not really able to provide good care for your family member or whoever's needing the care for you. Being patient and understanding, you always need to be patient and understanding because we truly don't understand what somebody feels. Imagine being um, the mom and dad that, or it's your mom and dad you're now caring for and they have to move into your home. We need to be patient and understanding to them because now they've lived in this home for 40 or 50 years and now they live in a spare bedroom of yours. You need to be patient and understanding of how that must feel to be independent and now they require someone to care for them. Um, to be a good advocate, advocating for someone else's needs, 
um, it's really important because um, now when you're taking somebody, let's say it's your mom, and you're now taking her to her doctor's appointments, and you're being an advocate, and you're advocating for um, maybe she can't afford her medication, and so you're really advocating at these doctor's appointments, and you know, um, I kind of make this joke sometimes that um, I need a part-time social worker. I need help sometimes to get my family members medications or to handle the paperwork and deal with the insurance companies that sometimes I feel like it's um, a whole nother job and I need to hire somebody to help me. So um, be a good advocate for your family member if you're the one that you're providing care. And of course, this is um, assist with the activities of daily living. Um, um, those of us that, you know, have worked as uh, patient care assistants or are currently working in nursing homes and things like that, you already know how much work it is to um, care for somebody else. But someone who's never provided like 24 hour care of another patient, um, if you never provided care for like another elderly family member, it's very different than caring for your own children. Um, for example, um, and in my, you know, his, my past, you know, worked in neuro, on the neuro floor, and when patients or families would not fully grasp um, that their mom would be going home completely paralyzed on the right side, and how much work that meant, that they sometimes they wouldn't fully grasp what that would mean when they would need 24-hour care they would think, well, my mom could do this stuff. Well, not anymore. And so that when you're taking on to be someone's full-time caregiver, what that fully means when you say that you need to assist with activities of daily living. It's not just getting them up in the chair and, you know, watching TV. It's turning every two hours. It's, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, bathing, um, bathroom. It's all of those needs need to be met. And then, of course, you know, providing um, emotional and social support. It's not just getting up in the chair and watching TV. You need to um, stimulate the emotional and the social aspect of it. You know, going to doctor's appointment, even maybe going to the senior center to interact with other seniors. And then managing and coordinating healthcare services. Like I said, sometimes you need somebody else to help because, um, managing the care with physicians appointments and trying to work and manage your own children also on top of this it can be a lot of work for somebody so um it takes a lot to want to be someone's caregiver and so it, as you can see there's probably about 10 things here that little checkoff list of attributes that it takes to be a good caregiver Several theoretical frameworks have been suggested to assess the psychological burden or rewards, as well as other factors related to family caregiving. The stress process model identifies the positive and negative aspects of caregiving. Lazarus and Folkman proposed a theoretical model highlighting the concepts of stress, appraisal, and coping. Caregi they stated that caregiving is very stressful and that the caregiver needs adequate support for effective coping. The theory of caregiving dynamics describes the positive forces that make possible the change and growth of the caregiver relationship. They stated that they stated some major concepts that included commitment, expectation, management, and role negotiation. The concepts presented in this theory serve as a communication points with family caregivers that with the opportunity to explore these associated feelings and discuss ways of promoting the caregiving experience. So let's talk a little bit about care, uh, caregiver stress. So prolonged caregiving can lead to, can be a chronic stressor. So how caregivers deal with the experiences and realities of caregiving depends on their own perception of the experience and their own coping abilities. So what is perception? Perception is the mental process of viewing and interpreting a person's environment. And caregivers' experience, um, experiences are not stressful unless the individual perceives them as stressful, right? So basically perception, what one may deem as stressful, another person may not. So 
psychological stress does have the potential to have a negative effect on health and well-being, right? When we say if you have high level of stress, you may, it's bad for your health. And so um, how caregivers react and respond to these challenges of caregiving depends on, on this caregiver's perception of the experience and their ability to cope and their coping resources. So if they don't have a lot of um, maybe they may not have siblings to help or they don't take time to practice some self-care or reach out for help or using resources, they're going to experience more caregiver strain. Um, and then their own individual expectations and their the, the culture behind that, right? Um, if we expect something to be really hard, it's going to be hard, right? If we're very negative about something, um, it's going to be negative. If we're always looking for the bad in things, we're only going to see the bad. Again, it's my perception on something. Um, if you come into something and they tell you um, the food is terrible, it's bad here, um, kind of like when you read reviews for a hotel, you're only going to see that. Um, I, I, I don't know if everybody considers this, but I consider this like your unconscious bias. It kind of sets you up for that. Um, so it's your perception to something. Um, also, if you don't have, like I said, those outlets or you're not looking for ways to kind of break up, it's very stressful being a caregiver. It's also very stressful in this nursing world, but it's very important to find your outlets and reach out and have that um, someone to talk to and reach out and kind of clear that space and take that time for yourself. It's important to understand the caregiver experience. Caregivers often face uncertainties about the present, the future, along with inadequate understanding of the disease. The caregivers simply do not know what's going to happen. So, for example, if we look at the case of patients with dementia, patients' behaviors often change daily. There are so many changes with the diseases that happen all the time, especially early in the beginning. So, um, like the person may be very quiet, cognitively intact with no um, noticeable, just slight memory changes. And then as the disease progresses, they become very violent or they can be combative or they wander. Um, and, the, and the children who are caring for their parent with dementia, they're ha having to leave work and things like that. So it's important that we try to um, help the caregiver or kind of help them understand what this journey will look like and you know it's important to also understand like how as nurses like where do we fit in this journey um so helping the caregiver understand like this is going to be a difficult journey no matter what your journey looks like um also understand like helping the caregiver understand like their perception and coping I always say this, most of us, I'm speaking for myself here too, um, a lot of us weren't taught appropriate coping skills. And so um, speaking from the nursing side, um, as we discharge people from the hospital, we need to also be educating and helping them and making sure that we give them the right tools in the toolbox as they're heading home with these new diagnoses and as they prepare for these new roles. Um, so it's not just, okay, now you have hypertension, diabetes, and, you know, dementia and things like that, but also with, um, paying attention to this new brand new caregiver. There's a lot of things that, that are happening on that side as well. Um, we need to understand that they're gonna. There's a lot of uncertainties about present and future, and then, like I said again, inadequate understanding of the disease. Just as the patient doesn't understand the new disease that they've been diagnosed with, also their caregiver now, um, which is also their emotional support. Um, the financial consequences of being the um, caregiver. Um, if the family member that now has the illness was the primary income, 
um, there's also those stressors of worrying about um, if this was a workman's comp issue and now it was an injury, like how to navigate those. Um, how are they going to make money? Um, and again, like I say, people aren't taught appropriate um, coping skills. And so when people, you know, sometimes, you know, being from the acute care setting, um, at times they would um, lash out at me. And in early on in my career, I would be very, very offended. Like, I don't understand why she's yelling at me or he's yelling at me or why the daughter's screaming at me today. But really, if I pull myself out of the, the equation and kind of step back and take a look, it really was not, they were not upset with me. They're more upset with the whole situation. And then as you ask different open-ended questions, you start to find out that she's a stay-at-home mom and he's the primary income and and she's worried about um, she's worried about now that they don't have any income now and she's worried about paying the rent next week and how they're gonna feed the three children they have and so really she's not mad at me she's mad at the situation and so it's nothing personal to me but I'm the only person right there that she can be upset with, if that makes sense to you. Um, so it's all those burdens, right? And so now if we also look at the social isolation and distress, if we look at that spousal caregiver, think of somebody who is in their 30s and now they've been in a car accident and this young couple, maybe they've barely been married, maybe less than five years. Um, Imagine being that husband or that wife that's now in this new role. Maybe they've had a traumatic brain injury or a neck injury and now they are never going to walk again. Um, imagine feeling that social isolation or um, how that's going to feel or what that looks like. So again, we're understanding the caregiver experience or what this difficult journey will look like, okay? Um, family relationships, they're all changed. They're all strained. Maybe they're strained. Um, if you look now, like if you reflect a little for a minute and just think of what your family looks like, is there relationships there that are already strained? Do you have siblings you don't talk to? And now you, you have to figure out, sit down all together in the family conference room and figure out how are we going to take care of mom? You know, and who's going to do that? What days? How's this going to look? How's it going to, who's going to help? I'm, you know, if I volunteer, but I need help, but I don't talk to anybody. So, these caregiver experiences, it's not as cut and dry as, sure, I'll take care of mom. They get very challenging, they get very difficult. Then again, changing roles and dynamics. Imagine being the grandma and grandpa who now have to come, come wherever they live and come pick up their grandchildren. Some grandparents never even met their grandchildren. So again, we talk about strained families that now have to pick up these roles. And then influence of culture on these caregiving experiences. In some cultures, there's no question. Mom and dad, you know, mom and dad move in with, you know, which child and that's just how it is, right? And then outcomes of caregiving. Um, like, what does this look like? You know, the fear of, um, um, I'm taking care of mom, but, I really don't, I'm really worried. I, you know, I never, I don't want to bury my mom or, you know, these kind of things. And so again, understanding what this looks like. So now as the nurse, you need to understand of like, what kind of support um, do we give? What is my role as the nurse? What, what is my role for this family? What is my, what kind of teaching do I need to give? What kind of nursing diagnosis is, what does the care plan look like for this family? 
So caregiving can have both positive and negative outcomes. How caregivers perceive their caregiving experience may influence their ability to focus on the positive aspects of caregiving. So if they focus more on the satisfaction that they receive from caring for a loved one or that they're actually fulfilling a duty, whether like in, in a certain culture that is their, you know, their, their duty to take care of their family members. Um, um, caregivers who have a pod, you know, it's, it's thought that caregivers who have a positive approach to life are better able to cope with caregiving demands and are motivated to maintain their caregiving role. While it's in contrast, caregivers who may become physically, emotionally, and financially overwhelmed with the responsibilities and demands of caring for a family member are, are more likely to actually be stressed or depressed or feel burdened by, by being a uh, caregiver. If one is not able to handle being a caregiver, it can lead to caregiver stress. And the signs of caregiver stress include irritability, inability to concentrate, fatigue, and sleeplessness. Stress can progress to burnout and result in negligence, and worse, lead to abuse of the family member by the caregiver. So nursing care is framed within a holistic approach that includes the nurse, the patient, the caregiver, and the whole family as a whole, right? Because they're the ones that are providing the care. When the nurse assesses a patient, he or she should include an assessment of the caregiver. Again, they're the ones that are there. They're the ones providing the care for this patient. They know the patient, right? And so the nurse should listen attentively to the caregiver's stories. These stories provide clues as to what li their lives are like and provide them the opportunity to share their per um, perceptions, experience, and coping as caregivers. Um, you know, and and even as you'll hear these talking, um, these caregivers talkings, sometimes they won't even identify themselves as the caregivers and they may view themselves only as carrying out an, ex ex an expected family responsibility and they really won't even acknowledge themselves as the caregiver. They'll, they'll think of themselves more as they're doing what is like required of them. Um, so, Caregivers are frequently unaware that they have like reached their breaking point. And so the first step in helping family caregivers is to identify themselves as the caregiver. Sometimes they can even be in denial of that. Um, caregivers have um, often, we, they'll refer to them as the hidden patient because common characteristics of caregivers is primarily having concern for their family member and often ignoring their own needs by the healthcare provider. So we really need to reach out to the healthcare uh, these uh, healthcare providers, I'm sorry, um, these um, caregivers, because they're just as important. And if they're neglecting themselves, they're also neglecting potential problems. And if they reach burnout, then who will be there to also care for these, these patients? So caregivers often need assistance, need outside assistance, and have difficulty asking for help because they do not want to be a burden on others and are actually afraid of being, I guess, rejected if they ask for help. And they actually may be even embarrassed or feel guilty for having a sick person in the family, especially when the disease has um, maybe some cognitive or memory or behavior components. And they believe it's their duty to be the single provider of care or do not have the financial resources um, to pay for assistance, right? So many caregivers often suffer in silence because they may not know how to ask for help or where to look for help, or they do not know that help is available for them. So really as nurses, we need to encourage care caregivers to seek and accept the support of family, friends, and community resources that are needed. So it's important for caregivers to understand that exhaustion and burnout are common consequences if they attempt to do everything themselves. And nurses can act as facilitator, facilitators and can help access and provide information about local and regional and even national resources for help. And um, there are there are many um, resources even available now with social media and things like that that you know people can reach out to and find. And sometimes once it can be as simple as once they find like a buddy on Facebook and in these support groups that once they find out like they're not alone and like feeling that these feelings that they're feeling um validate them, then it kind of, that they validate these feelings that they feel um, um kind of reinforces that they're not alone 
and that there's others going through this makes them feel a whole lot better. And once they get some of these feelings they're feeling off their chest, they feel so much better. And so it's important for us to acknowledge these feelings and, you know, tell them that it's okay to feel this way. Um, and then that'll also improve this relationship they have with being the caregiver and um, the family member that they're providing care for. Because sometimes this can be very strained as well. So we need to really reach out and acknowledge because sometimes the patients won't reach out to us. And so like sometimes like I tell people, um, you need to listen to what is not being said um, and bring it up yourself because they're afraid to ask. Another way nurses can help can assist caregivers is to help them understand and cope with the stressors of caregiving. You know, as nurses, we can communicate as some a sense of empathy for the caregiver by allowing them to discuss the burdens and rewards of caregiving. Sometimes just having someone to listen will allow them to feel so much better. You know, like I said, when we looked at the attributes of what a good caregiver is, one of them was just being a good listener. So by giving that caregiver that, that, that time and time to just talk to us and us not even saying a word, just being a good listener, um, they will feel, begin to feel like they have an outlet. Um, just having that objective third party that is not going to judge them, is not going to give them their, give them our opinion or belittle them. And then when it's all said and done and we tell them, you know, you're doing a great job, you know, we're so proud of you, um, you're really just doing awesome, sometimes that's all they need, right? So, um, you know, it, really that's sometimes all people ask. And again, offering them our, our empathy, right? We're, as nurses, like, we we have that. And by telling somebody, again, you're doing a great job, your mom's doing great, she looks great, and that's, you're doing that. Um, that really, it, um, it makes them feel good. It's almost like you feel like sometimes when your kids get good grades on their test and you help them study, it's kind of like that. Like, you know, their cholesterol is doing good and you're making the meals. So, you're, you know, good job. Um, because sometimes when you're at home and you feel like you're silently suffering, um, just having somebody tell you you're doing good, it just makes you feel good, right? And then uh, nurses must monitor the caregiver for indications of declining health and emotional distress. Um, you know, this isn't very, this is very important, right? Because sometimes it's very easy as the caregiver to be so focused on these doctor's appointments and, she, you know, he or she has to go here and she has to go there, that sometimes you forget about even just your basic, uh, maybe you don't get your flu shot and you don't do this, but it's important just as your flu shot, you need to get your flu shot because um, maybe your mom gets chemo and it would also protect your mom. So um, a strategy we can to help reduce um, stress is to help the caregivers acknowledge feelings of stress and plan for self-care activities. And so these, you know, setting them up with support groups, they provide self-help for sharing experiences and, you know, information and offering understanding and acceptance. And they also encourage the caregiver to um, seek help from a formal social group. Um, and so there's just a lot of opportunities for them, right? And then there's different levels of nursing care, you know, caring for the caregiver physically, caring for the um, caregiver emotionally, caring for the caregiver socially, um, cognitively, um, and spiritually. And so if we're going to care for the caregiver um, physically, we could reinforce the um, importance of a healthy diet at regular times, exercising. Um, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, even in the hospital, like, I haven't even eaten today. And so if we really start talking to them about things, they'll say, like, well, I, I eat, I don't know, when the last time I had a good meal. And so just talking to them about the importance of that. Um, you know, caring for the caregiver emotionally, we can talk, you know, they can, we can, you know, offer ideas about, you know, keeping a journal in which they can express their feelings that may be too difficult to express. 
Um, they can, you know, encourage care to continue their social activities like interests and hobbies. Maybe if they're on their own, maybe they can hire somebody to come in, you know, maybe once a week in the evening um, to give them a little bit of break. Um, about caring for the caregiver socially, Nur nurses can promote social support for caregivers. Physical contact with others um, provides emotional support and acknowledgement of the caregiver's own needs for comfort and assurance. So, um, it's, you know, by letting them know it's okay to like take a couple hours off again. Um, caring for the caregiver cognitively, nurses can encourage the caregiver to appraise his or her perceptions, situations, and try to maintain a positive perspective. Now, again, it's all about perception. What may be stressful for, for one may not be stressful to another. So it, again, it's important to step away from that situation. Um, you know, that's what I said, you know, like, if they step away and they come back, they may not see that same situation as as stressful as they once saw it. And then caring for the caregiver spiritually. And nurses can nourish the spirits of family caregivers and help them maintain a sp sense of awe about life. Um, find out like if they are spiritual and you don't have, you know, don't confuse this with religion and spiritual. You can be spiritual and not religious. Um, but especially with things, conversations like um, end of life um, may be important to connect them with um, um, if they are spiritual or if they are religious, you know, keeping that um, support from um, communities of faith is always important, right? Um, so, if they can't leave the home, many of these um, uh, communities of faith, they'll come to you. And so we can refer them and get them in contact with somebody and um, bring them to their home. But again, it's all important in, you know, maintaining that physical, emotional, spiritual um, well-being of the caregiver and the patient. Many concepts presented in this chapter are related to the caregiver. Three concepts that are closely linked to the caregiver are family dynamics, culture, and spirituality. Caregiving can trigger many changes in the family structure and family roles. Cultural influences a person's definition of family, the relationships among family members, and the perception of the caregiver's responsibilities or identity. Caregivers can be motivated to provide care for many different reasons. Other Adherence to the caregiver role include feeling that our designated role is unavoidable, the need to keep a promise, or the lack of alternatives. These motives usually create a tense environment in which the caregiver may provide a minimum level of care, or there's a chance of neglect. The caregiver may feel unable to keep up their role or their own disease self-management. Stress is the inability to cope with this perceived threat to one's mental, emotional, or spiritual well-being that can result in a series of psychological responses, and that include fatigue. Coping, though, is the process through which a person manages the demands placed on the personal person's environment relationship, and the emotions generated by this given situation is influenced by the person's cognitive appraisal of the event. The caregiver's mood and effect is influenced by their ability to cope with the experience. Caregivers may become overwhelmed and experience great anxiety, which may result in addictions or different kinds and may, ref may, ref may be the reflection of caregiver burnout, low self-esteem, or a history of psychosocial problems. Establishing effective communication between the caregiver and the patient and the healthcare provider is essential in order to support the positive aspect of caregiving and minimize um, negative aspects. Health promotion is expected is the expected result of an effective communication process and education. Deciding which is the right moment to request palliative care consult in the in the case of patient with declining health status can make a major difference in the health care and treatment decisions going forward. As always, care coordination can be achieved when the needs of the patient and his or her family members are discussed with other members of the interdisciplinary team. The results are positive outcomes for patients and their caregivers are efficient use of the healthcare resources. A wide variety of conditions and situations contribute to the need of an individual to require caregiving. 
and the variability in the level of care needed is influenced by multiple variables, including age and underlying health status. Impaired physical mobility, many disease and rehabilitative states involve some degree of immobility. Some examples of these conditions may be stroke, traumatic injuries, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's dis disease. Um, with impaired mobility, individuals experience a decrease in muscle mass, strength, or function. Um, these patients, uh, recipients, are total dependents on their caregivers. Impaired cognitive status. These are patients that have changes in cognition and can be highly stressful for caregivers. Individuals with moderate to severe changes in their level of cognition often require um, special care, which includes 24 hours a day supervision, special communication techniques, and management of their own, of their difficult behavior. Um, sometimes they can be very aggressive and unpredictable, and they will become totally dependent on their caregivers for assistance of ADLs. And these conditions um, can be traumatic brain injury, dementia, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson's disease. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder occurs when individuals are exposed to traumatic events that, that engender extreme levels of fear um, for the safety of self and others. Um, PTSD is treatable, but it can become very chronic and disabling condition. And in some it, it, severe cases of PTSD leads to disability and these individuals may experience um, symptoms of nightmares, um, hyperarousal, re-experience reminders of the trauma, flashbacks to the event. Um, after traumatic injury or experience, experience, individuals must cope with psychological and physical factors. They may even have prolonged hospital stays, delayed recovery times. Um, this can be very disabled, disabling for the affected individual and they be, um, become the responsibility of a caregiver. An impaired respiratory function can be a result of several diseases or conditions, for example, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, pneumonia, asthma, or cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis, excuse me. Respiratory failure can be acute or chronic. In severe cases of lung disease, long-term care may be needed to provide continuous breathing support through mechanical ventilation. In the majority of these cases, individuals who require mechanical ventilation or continuous oxygen to sustain their lives require the assistance of formal and informal caregivers. So that means that we have to bring in like respiratory therapist and maybe a nurse or LVN or RN and that would help care for them. And then we also have substance abuse. Substance abuse refers to damaging or harmful psych psychoactive um, substances. This may be alcohol or drugs. And these have negative consequences um, um, of drug abuse and not only on the limited time of the abuser, but rather they um, influence the entire family. Um, family members have they have um, experienced domestic violence, stress. Um, also, in the case of children, they may have behavioral problems. In addition, close family members of drug addicted uh, individuals sometimes become the sole caregivers of the abuser due to financial, legal, and physical restraints. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to let um, your instructor know. And thank you for listening to this lecture.